I've obviously been playing a lot of Core Designs games over the past month or so in the process of making the rather large documentary that I released last week. If you've watched that and enjoyed it, well, thank you. If you haven't, then perhaps you could use this as a bit of a springboard to watch it. Now as is pretty common, it's now time for me to do the more personal follow-up video, a quick one that simply lists the games of theirs that I've enjoyed the most. This one is a little different. There is after all one series of games that kind of dominates everything when it comes to core, and it would be obvious to simply stick a lot of Tomb Raider games on the list. So, in the interest of helping folks discover some lesser known titles, and keeping a bit of suspense, this is my top 20 favourite core design games that aren't Tomb Raider. One of the themes of my video, after all, is that Core Design did a lot more than just the adventures of Lara Croft, and this video here is in service of that. Apologies if your favourite doesn't make it, but the comments are there for you to do lord knows what. And so, let's begin. It's pretty fair to class Core Design as the kins of the Mega CD. While so many other developers were busy futzing around with full motion video, they were using the enhanced powers of the system to produce pretty cool 3D titles. The likes of Sarah Avery and Jason Gee were filled with talent, and they predicted where the future of games was actually headed. Soulstar is the first of a couple of Mega CD games here, a very good rail shooter that's very much along the lines of the more famous Star Fox on SNES, only if anything it runs smoother and has a bit more variation in the gameplay. It's one of the Mega CD's great technical showcases, and it's a shame that more studios didn't take Core Design's path when it's clear just what the add-on was capable of. As mentioned in the video, Ninja is something of a guilty pleasure. The title was never thought of very well at the time, and it's got quite a lot of jank. This is very much a nostalgic choice, because I remember playing the demo of the game an awful lot back in the day, but as a beat em up with a whole bunch of platforming and puzzle elements, I find it to be a far more entertaining and engaging game than something like the more famous Fighting Force. Pretty decent music too. It's a long game for what it is, probably far too long in fact, but a good one to play in doses here and there. Swagman kind of belongs in a similar class to Ninja. Again, it's quite long for being a puzzle and action-y top-down title, and there is quite a bit of jank about it, but a cool and creative setting does go a long way here. While I've always enjoyed the general aesthetic of 32-bit titles, it's nice to have a game like this one that's a bit more bright and colourful, not to mention smooth. And of the various games from this generation that fit said bill, this is one of the more overlooked titles. Definitely one that's worth playing. Some people might not have expected Rick to feature here. Perhaps they've seen me on stream raging at the damn thing. It's one of the most frustrating games ever made for a bloody good reason. And yet, over time, I've played quite a lot of Rick Dangerous and, well, over the course of learning more about the game, there's a respect for it. A respect for the game's commitment to sheer ruthlessness, perhaps, and how much it clearly enjoys messing with you. There's no way I'd ever want to play this without having infinite lives, but something about the game's character does let me enjoy it, in a way. That and its influence on more modern platformers that also embrace high difficulty, albeit in a more forgiving manner, can't really be ignored. I enjoy a lot of games like that, so in the end, there's definitely a place for the Grand Daddy. Very few, if any studios, have made a game like Hurdy Gurdy. Even in Core's late period, just before everything went very wrong indeed, the creativity of the studio is there for all to see. 
Sure, it wasn't liked by everybody. You're never going to get everyone to like a cartoony shepherding game where the management and chasing of animals that aren't always going to listen to you is the main mechanic. But I get a kick out of it. And more than that, this game represents a very creative era for gaming. People screwed around and made an awful lot of weird and enjoyable games on the PlayStation 2. And Hurdy Gurdy is a pretty good poster child for those times. <laughs> Rick Dangerous 2 naturally lies pretty close to the original title. The sequel doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it adds a few fun mechanics such as sliding bombs, and it is a little less unfair. Just a bit. There aren't so many outrageous frame-perfect jumps in this one. The alien aesthetic of the second game, giving our hero more of a Buck Rogers type vibe as opposed to an Indiana Jones one, is also preferable to me. It ups the B-movie silliness of it all, and comedy is something that Rick Dangerous does have a decent line in, even if it's often at your expense. A pretty good little game that you may well have a laugh at through gritted teeth. Thunderhawk is a perfectly okay game on the Amiga. It's aged a fair bit better than a lot of other games of its silk, mainly because it doesn't feature lots of extraneous fluff, such as performing 20 separate actions just to take off, that essentially functions as an elaborate copy protection scheme. But on the Mega CD? Well, the game comes into its own. A stunning game to be playing on a console in 1992, packed with intense chopper combat, a good speed to go along with all the textures that the game now has, and the appropriate level of cheesy rock guitar. It's not all that far off from the much more venerated Strike games, quite frankly. Thunderhawk smashed it in 3D years before that series made the jump. Incoming missile. It's a shame that so few people talk about Skeleton Crew. Being that it's such a late Mega Drive game, it does tend to get a bit ignored. This is another game that was totally cool on the Amiga, but is much better on console. It runs much better, and has some pretty great Martin Iverson music to match the action. It feels like after all this time, Skeleton Crew is getting a bit more respect on its name, getting cited by the likes of Bitmap Bureau as an inspiration for games like Xeno Crisis. And being that it's one of the best games of the Mega Drive's final days, it absolutely deserves that. Core Design's software lineup doesn't feature an awful lot of sports or racing titles, for whatever reason. One might think that perhaps after the success of Tomb Raider, the company didn't really feel like they needed to go down that road. But Jaguar XJ220 shows that they most certainly could pull off a cracking racing game, a game that does justice to a license for what was the world's fastest supercar at the time. Whether you play this on the Amiga or the Mega CD, you'll find a game that's not all that far off from Magnetic Field's iconic Lotus titles. It'd certainly be right alongside it at the front of the grid. Now I'm sure I could use a few other tortured racing metaphors to convey the excellence of this title, but a good racing game like this one usually tends to speak for itself. Obviously we've got a plum space reserved for Chuck Rock in this top 20. One of Core's most famous platformers in the 16-bit era, Chuck Rock is the perfect showcase for what Core did differently from their peers. They didn't have much of an interest in ripping off Mario or Sonic, and instead created a hero that's the total antithesis of that, an obese caveman with a belly push. They didn't follow the usual Euro platformer trends. No having to collect a bunch of junk, no lethal water droplets, no constant leaps of faith. Even if some games that do follow those mechanics still definitely have charm, by and large cause games have held up a lot better today than most of the competition. Chuck Rock's solid play is there for all to see, and a wicked sense of humour helps it along. Deservedly a big smash.
The Chopper is back again. Thunderhawk on the Mega CD is a marvellous achievement, while the perhaps lesser known Thunderhawk 2 refines the formula and gives us one of the best looking early 32-bit titles. Yes, it does suffer from quite a bit of popping, but other than that it's still quite a nice game to look at even now, thanks to the quality of the textures. I mean seriously, this was treated as photorealistic back in 1995. Other than that, well it's the same fantastic military combat. Some people tend to forget that the Thunderhawk games were one of Core's biggest successes. In fact, they may have been bigger than anything by the studio that didn't feature a panting aristocratic adventurer. And one reason for that is due to the games being immediately playable and immediately very freaking good. Main target dead ahead. Sometimes the more simple games need a bit of a shout. Carve Up is an early core design game indeed, and yet here it is in the top 10. What we have here is a good example of a game that's heavily inspired by an arcade, in this case IOM City Connection, but this one doesn't just match its inspiration, it beats it handily. It's City Connection on steroids, with a whole load of power-ups, a ton of different settings and enemies, and all the immediate arcade play thoroughly intact. Clearly the superior game of the two, and one of the best of course straight up arcade titles from their early days. The core design platforming formula is once again very much present in Bubba and Sticks. Don't follow everyone else, add a fair bit of humour, and make the whole thing very playable. We're going to be seeing this a few more times in the top 10, but Bubble and Sticks is the one that leans into more of a puzzling formula, featuring absolutely no end of ingenious things that you, a regular handyman, can do with a sentient stick. The game didn't get a lot of success at the time, but it absolutely deserves to be known an awful lot better nowadays. One of the best puzzle platformers you can find. Chuck Rock's neonatal driven sequel is one of those that goes ahead and changes things. Playing as baby Chuck is a very different experience to playing as his dad, what with having a big old club to swing about and everything, but the Chuck Rock formula is very much still here, and the result is an even better game that also features plenty of technical goodness. It's a real shame that the Chuck Rock team were never able to make the third game that would have likely featured Ophelia, as I wonder what they'd have done there to make it different. This is just an absolutely brilliant little platformer. Wolfchild is a bit darker than most of the platformers we've seen so far. Not much in the way of cartoony antics, this one's chock full of HR Giga-esque landscapes and other flights of fantasy. And once again it's another exceptional game that ought to get way, way more love. It's funny really because when I play this game, I really don't understand why, particularly on consoles, it just didn't seem to review well at all. It's a great fast platformer, complete with a brilliant mechanic of overdriving your health bar, turning into the wolf, and doing everything possible to keep it that way. What's not to love? But hey ho, old games are much more equal now, and Wolf Child deserves your attention. The top 5 kicks off with another not very well known title. The lukewarm reception to Darkmere is a bit more understandable, what with the tortured development and incredibly long delays and so on, but this brooding and foully depressing isometric adventure is a quality one, far superior to the Heimdall games as far as I'm concerned. The main drive for that is of course the quality of Mark K. Jones' artwork. It is one hell of a game to look at, and this graphical excellence softens some of the game's more annoying aspects, the rather cumbersome inventory system for example. This is an adventure that you can easily just get lost in, and it's an absolute shame that so few people seem to have covered it at all.
No prizes at all for guessing that Switchblade was going to be very high up the list. Simon Phipps's side project is the best of Core Design's early batch, by some distance. It's everything you've ever enjoyed in a classic flip screen computer platformer, only ramped up several degrees. All a great adventure, all a precision, and some refreshing additions like the combat and the plentiful hidden areas. The flip screen platformer largely died out in the 16 bit generation, where computers were clearly capable of a lot more technically. Switchblade feels like a fitting tribute and ending to the glory days of a genre that defined the 8 bit micros, a game that pushes the formula just about as far as it was going to go in 1989. And let's not forget the late great Ben Daglish's music, too. What a game! Now this is the game in the top 3 that's probably going to be a big surprise. I'm generally not known for my appreciation of point and click adventures, after all. That and even at the time, Universe was a polarising game. Some magazines like The One and See You Amiga loved it, giving it rave reviews. Others, particularly Amiga Power, utterly hated it, they gave it 21%. It doesn't exactly control like either the LucasArts or the Sierra Adventures, having its own quirks that can be a bit frustrating. But, my god, just look at it! I'm not being funny, this is one of the most beautiful looking and sounding adventure games I have ever seen. Every screen is a work of art. And yes, even if the game does have its quirks, really it doesn't take too long to get used to them. Universe took me by surprise with how quickly I learned to love it, and even if the list of my favourite point and click games is probably a short one, this is most definitely on there. With Tomb Raider out of the equation, two games clearly stood out from the rest of the pack as the contenders for the top spot. One is a platformer, and one is a shoot 'em up, both of which shine not just for immense technical quality, but their creativity too. In the end, the shoot 'em up just came second. Banshee is a glorious shooter, and even if it's not like it's the only great shooter you'll find on the Amiga, for me it is the best one. The lengthy levels are packed full of memorable moments and wonderful details to the point where, even though they are so long, I can remember just about every part of them immediately. That weird thing where you can almost play a game in your mind. As amazing as it is to look at, it's just as good to play. It's got just the right level of difficulty for a Euro shoot 'em up. Pretty bloody tricky without being stupidly unfair. This game's given me some of the most fun I've ever had on the Amiga, and it's done that since 1995. So obviously it's one of my favourites. Of course, this means that the top spot went to Premiere. If you've seen the documentary, that might not be a surprise. Hell, I even went ahead and used the game's beautiful ending to finish the vid. Anyway, any good platformer should have more than a few flourishes. The moments where the game takes a risk, does things different from the norm, and it pays off. This game here? Premiere is one giant flourish, there is absolutely no other platformer like it, certainly not in the 16-bit generation. Everything here is a beautiful, daring risk, from the dual planes to the boss fights, the ingenious mazes, all of the enemies, and amazingly, most of it comes off. The 8th day seemingly built a platformer with the golden rule that absolutely everything should be completely different, right down to the very basic mechanics and somehow it all worked. If this game came out on a console, it may well be celebrated now as one of the greatest platformers of the era. Because it's only on the Amiga, it's not quite as well known. This should change, and much like in the big video this list comes from, well if there's one core message <laughs> you should take, it's simple one. Play Premiere now. That is all. Anyhow, Hopefully you've enjoyed this list, hopefully you've enjoyed or will enjoy the documentary that goes with it, and hopefully, in the end, it's just given you some more excellent games to play. But, until the next time,
Bye for now.